Welcome to the Speak With People podcast. My name is Jason Rates, and I'll be your host today. Well, as you may remember, this podcast exists because we believe healthy communication is oxygen for our relationships and our leadership. So whether you communicate one-on-one, on a team, from a stage, or from behind a screen, we really hope that this time together encourages you and inspires you and challenges you to choose healthy communication. We can all choose unhealthy communication, but when you choose to communicate in healthy ways, you really will change your world for the better and you will change the world for the better. Well, today we're gonna encourage you a bit to just stop talking about your dreams. I mean, so many of us have just gotten into this rut. And so, you know, it's it's often uh, on a communication podcast where we, you know, dive into communication, but we wanna talk about how do we communicate about our dreams? And so we're kind of diving into some secret habits that that performer performance leaders kind of get more out of life why does it seem that most people would rather talk about their dreams than actually start doing something? Would you rather tell others or just kind of keep it uh, a secret? What holds you back from dreaming and proudly telling the world, this is what we're going to do? And so I'm so excited about our guest today. We're joined by Jerome Myers, a, f- a former Fortune 550 division leader, nationally recognized multifamily investor, a peak performance business coach, entrepreneur. And I just, I'm so excited about this conversation and where it's going to go. Jerome, welcome to the Speak With People podcast. We're so excited that you're here. Man, so good to be with you and your audience, Jason. Thanks for having me, man. This is, this is going to be a great conversation. I love challenging folks. And so if they want to stay there where they are, exactly where they are, how they are, they probably should skip this episode. (laughs) It's going to rock their world if we do what we're supposed to do here. I love it. again. Absolutely. Well, hey, before we jump into the 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 content and the the questions, could you just give us? I know I gave a little brief, you know, intro to you, but kind of just give us a little bit more behind the behind the scenes of your story, who you are, you know, what you do, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, man. So I guess the place to really start is when I decided that I was going to leave corporate America. I was employee number two, January thirteenth of twenty fifteen, and they said, "Hey, Jerome." you're going to be doing something that's never been done before. I was like, yeah, okay, what's the big deal? We had zero dollars in revenue. Fast forward, September 30th, I've got 175 people on my team. Wow. December 24th, I'm doing the final thing. Man, we crossed $20 million. This is amazing. 30% profit margins. And about 4.55, I get a phone call. And I go something like this. Hey, Jerome, we're going to lay half of the team off. Wait, what do you mean? That's not the right answer. He says, yeah, well, you and I have been going back and forth on this, but I made a decision. And I said, yeah, but that's not the right decision. He said, yeah, I, I hear you, but we're going to lay half the team off. Oh. This isn't a debate. This isn't a discussion. It's not a negotiation. I'm letting you know. And, you know, I'm pretty stubborn, Jason. So I came back at him. Hey, look, this isn't what we're going to do. And he said, hey, look, man, it's 4.59 on Christmas Eve. I'm going to go spend the rest of the year with my family. I'll talk to you in the new year. I was like, uh and then the phone went dead, right? The three boobs that you get from the iPhone, right? And I was like, oh, bro. Sure. And so I spent that holiday not eating, not sleeping much, uh-huh. trying to figure out how we could make this as objective as possible. And in that moment, I gave all of my my agency away. I said, hey, they make, they're make they making me do this. Hmm. They're making me do this. I, I, I didn't have a choice. I just had to do what they told me to do. And so we put Humpty Dumpty back together again, made another run. Now it's two days before the Thanksgiving break. And I said, hey, guys, uh, I don't know what's going to happen between now and the end of the year. But don't spend all your money on Black Friday. And when those words came out my mouth, I felt all my leadership credibility ooze out with my body and onto the floor. And it was in that moment that I decided I had to do something different. I needed to exit the Matrix because... I had a choice. I just wanted it to be somebody else's fault right? for the choice that I was making. Wow. And so I I left um, and started doing real estate full time. Thought I was going to buy an apartment. Long story. This isn't a real estate podcast, so I'll save the listeners that. Went and did some other stuff. Eventually got into apartment buildings. And then in 2020, I realized that I was pretty lonely. I was a lone wolf. I was just out here finding and hunting deals. 
And I said, man, I miss the people. And it was the only thing that I missed from corporate America was the development piece. Helping people achieve those goals that they might not be able to if they didn't have a strong leader. And so I was like, man, I've been holding one client for about a decade. I'm going to ramp this thing up and really start working with founders, visionaries, Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs to help them take their thing to the next level. And it wasn't until a couple of weeks ago that what I truly realized I do is work with people in existential crises. And so these are people who are in a space where they're asking one of three questions. Is this really it? What was it all for? Or what now? Mm. When people are asking one of those three questions, they need to give me a call because we help them navigate that process. The first one, is this really it, is one where you are, you've achieved a milestone and what you thought was going to be this huge celebration and transformational event ended up being the person who gets to the end of the rainbow and finds out that there's no pot of gold. Wow. Right. For the person who is asking, um, what was it all for? They sacrificed all these things and they realized that that sacrifice might not have been worth it. Hmm. And so now they're committed to making sure that what they do has meaning and purpose along the way instead of trying to get to a destination. And then the what now is a person who got what they said they wanted. It's usually some type of financial freedom. Hmm. And then they say, what do I do now? Because this thing that I've been working on took all of the energy, the effort, the thought for me to do that. And many times those folks have forgotten how to dream. Wow. And so they need help finding that new dream, that new space, that new place. And so that's where we spend all of our time. And it doesn't matter what the triggering event is. And we can talk about triggers if you want, but that that's what we help people do. We, we help them navigate those existential crises. Wow. Wow. Boy, that's uh, that's some powerful stuff. So, you know, kind of jumping into this idea of, you know, why does it seem like some days I'm surrounded by people who are doing just that? They're making their dreams, you know, come true, become a reality. And then some days it seems like all I do is just talk about my dreams. You know, what's holding so many people back from going from just talking about them to actually, you know, stepping into that reality and going after them? Yeah, we, we've got this framework that we call the red pill or, or model for centered life. And level one of that framework is self-image. Mm-hmm. So the person that you're describing is playing a character in a story. And we're all playing characters in a story. The character that they're playing in the story is the victim. And it's very similar to the person or the character I was playing when I was telling the story about that phone call I got. Yeah. I was a victim. The yep. other people, the villains, told me that I had to lay people off and I was just being compliant or complicit with what was dictated to me. Well, those are two characters, but there's four in every story in order for it to work, right? And so there's a guide that's usually not you in your story because you're the main character. Right. So you're either the victim, the hero, or the villain, right? And so we've already identified if you've given your agency away, you're the victim. You would if you make your dreams a reality because you're a victim, but we've got to move you from being a victim to being a hero. And so when you think about a hero, when you think about a victim, they show up in very different ways, right? They're asking a victim is questioning themselves. A hero is confident in themselves. They're showing up right. with the expectation to deliver the outcome. And that mindset is of extreme importance. When I think about in the way that we get results, there is a belief. The belief shapes the way that we think about events. So belief, thought, action, result, right? Those four things happen every time we get to a place of result. So the belief shapes the way that the things happen and how we interpret them. That decides whether or not you go to victim or hero state. Mm. And those thoughts then lead you to take an action, right? If you have success in that action, then it further perpetuates your confidence. If you don't get the success you desire, then it ruins your confidence. Then you are less likely to take more action because you didn't get the outcome you want. Right. And so the way that somebody moves from that victim, that hero space is 
they interpret things in a way where they believe they can win and then they take some action to achieve a small goal, right? This is creating a snowball, create a very small goal where they can prove that they actually have the outcome they desire. And then from there, build on that. And if you can get the flywheel going, you can stay out of victimhood and be in hero state a lot because you've got the proof, right? Right. Wow, goodness. So kind of walk us through, like, when did you, you know, figure this out for yourself? Was it that moment with the call? Was that it? Was it, you know, kind of years building up to that? Like, when did you, and, and was it that call that finally gave you the push or was it a, a bunch of things over time that you, you finally just made that decision to move forward? You know, connecting the dots is something that happens on a now daily day, but nobody's ever asked me the question the way that you have, Jason. And so what I would say is I really first connected the dot when I was in a undiagnosed depression back in 2010. Mm. Uh, my first daughter was six and I feel like both of us were going through some type of postpartum depression. I couldn't do anything right at home, do anything right at work. I, where except for in the fence of the football field where I was a coach that got paid $2,000 um, as kind of the night job that I was doing after my engineering work. Wow. And for the life of me, I couldn't understand why nothing was working. I couldn't understand. And I was just waiting and, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to give up all of the secular stuff and I'm just going to listen to praise music and I'm going to go to church multiple times a week because, you know, that's what my parents taught me to do. And I got to a place and this may scare some people, but it's okay. I got to a place where I started questioning everything, Jason. Nothing was off limits. Yeah. I would call it a quake moment. And when I got there, I realized that I was just doing things because of ritual, mm. not because it was something that I knew was real for me but because I saw other people do it and they told me it worked. And so as I was doing the praying and the other stuff, I heard no response. I heard no answers. I, I was like, what am I waiting for? Who am I waiting for? Is somebody going to come save me? And I'm just cowering as this victim. And I was like, well, what if it's going to happen? It's up to me. I've got to take action. I've got to see things in a way where I can win. I, 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 and I went from that, I, victimhood where I'm questioning myself to gaining confidence, getting more clear, more confident and moving into that hero state and did everything work every time it did not. But I learned from that low spot, there was so much more that I could get and there was so much more I could do. And when I walked into the room and I held my head high and my chest was out, uh, people treated me different. Then when I walked in with my head down and my posture slouched, right? And that in and of itself made a difference in how I started interpreting. And so that was, for me, was the transformation. And there were some other things that happened early on. We, we found that there's like five things that Apex performers go through. People who are going to go achieve uh, massive success. And you don't have to have all of them, but some of them are necessary because I think it's what it takes to get the scrappiness. And I, I'm not sure if you want to go into those, but we, we found that those experiences, um, it's just pattern recognition. We found that they yeah. show up for everybody that's uh, going to go to the space or the yeah. stable. Yeah. I mean, we don't have to hit all five, but I, boy, I'm so curious now. Yeah. Even if you want to hit a couple of them, that, that would be, that'd be great. Yeah. I mean, I can run through all five and then yeah. if there's something you're curious about, we'll go deep on those. Right. And so the first one is they have a near-death experience. The second one is they experience total financial ruin or you know something very close to that. The next one is they lose somebody who is close to them at an early age. The fourth one is some type of um, mental health issue. I, I, we, we kind of make it pretty there. I call it suicidal ideation, mm -hmm. depression, the deep yeah. stuff. And then the last one is being a people pleaser. Mm. So at some point, usually there's a seed drop that you're only good if you achieve or you make other people happy. Wow. And so they spend more life chasing that. And so those five things, and you don't have to have all five, but those five things are 
kind of embedded in the experience of the folks that we see that go to the highest heights. Wow. Wow. Yeah, those are, uh, <clears throat> those are, anyone on their own is tough, you know, but I, I would gather that, you know, many leaders have, you know, I'm even thinking through my life, have been through, you know, mu- multiple ones when you're, you're yeah. trying to, you know, figure all those things out. Where? And I don't ever ask anybody to talk about them, but I, I admit openly that I've been through all five, right? Just so that nobody yeah. ever feels alone. I've yeah. been through all five. Wow. Well, and that's, I mean, that's, I mean, people uh, relate to leaders who are transparent and authentic with their own journey and to be able yeah. to just, you know, share that because we sometimes feel so alone, like, oh, I'm the only person, you know, going through this, you know, I, even in my own life, we started this little company called Speak With People back in the the fall. And, you know, some days I have those thoughts where it's like, okay, is this ever going to succeed? Are we ever going to get that next, you know, foot forward? And then I get around other small business owners and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not the only one having some of these thoughts, but I got to change the thoughts to the other, you know, the other side pretty quick. Do you, I mean, do you find that our own thoughts hinder us more than the thoughts of others? you know, other people kind of given our thoughts or, or is it kind of equal for us moving forward on some things? So this, it's not equal because we're with our own thoughts all the time. Half right. And so that part is more important. This is part of the reason why we go to self-image first. And so how we define self-image is the way you think about yourself, the way you think other people think about you mm-hmm. and the promises that you keep to yourself. And so it's not what they think because you don't know what they think. All you know is what you think they think about you. And I think that's where we get in trouble because depending on what self-talk we have, the way we think about ourselves, it taints the interaction engagement with other people. Yes. And so, no, I I absolutely believe that it's an inside job, man. You, You figure out what you have to do and then from there, um, you, you get a really, really cool outcome. Mm. So you, I mean, you, if with the self image, like you, you really have to do a lot of internal surgery to get to the place where, you know, you, you're, you're believing in yourself. You're believing that, Hey, I can accomplish these things. I can move forward. I don't have to accept, you know, this old way of life. You know, what are, what are some of the things that have helped you or, or you teach others you know, to kind of have that healthy self-image to go from that negative self-talk to, you know, no, I, I can do these things. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting is most people just avoid this work, Mm. right? They don't want to go here. It's messy. And when I say most people, I'll, I'll even talk practitioners, right? Folks who are supposed to help people work through this, this is the hard work. And so it, there's a number of different questions you can ask, but the place I love to go first is, hey, do you have any childhood trauma? Mm. And I, we go there because we think that we grow up and that it just goes away because we're older. Right. But if you haven't done anything to process it, then there's this crying boy or girl that's inside of you that at times comes out and throws a temper tantrum and creates all types of chaos and havoc in your life. If the person can answer that question with no, and you know, there's very few people that I've met that can actually say, no, I don't have any. Then the question is, well, have you had any trauma as an adult that Mm -hmm. is all resolved? And notice that, I mean, those five things, except for maybe the people pleaser thing is trauma. And my favorite one is financial trauma, right? Mm -hmm. You lose money or it's taken from you or you make a mistake and it doesn't work out, whatever, however you want to quantify it, you only have been a place where you're questioning whether or not you are financially viable. And in that space or on the backside of that space, you promise yourself you'll never be poor again. You start to hoard, right? right? And you've got these behaviors that are great for somebody who's trying to survive with an environment that is trying to kill them right? Saber tooth tiger, T-Rex type stuff. Right. <laughs> right. That, is, that environment doesn't exist anymore. Are you, when, when you take inventory of the way that you're behaving, 
is it appropriate for the environment that you're in right now? Yep. And if it's not, then what can we do to make an adjustment? What would yep. be more appropriate? That's where the magic starts mm. because you can leave behind the behaviors that are not serving you and start doing the things that will move you closer to that mission, vision, dream that you have. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Well, it, it just, you know, everything in life is a journey. And it's it's just, as I, as I hear you talk about that, especially the steps and the phases, you know, just figuring out the journey is, you know, so incredibly important, uh, you know, to be able to do when we get to that place. I've heard you talk about, you know, forgetfulness and how it can, you know, be used by leaders to help them succeed. Like, can you explain more about that when it comes to forgetfulness? Yeah. So I played football for about 17 years. Wow. And one of the things that our coaches taught us to do was to forget the bad play, right? You make a mistake, the next play is getting ready to start, so move on. So what we encourage leaders to do is to forget when things don't go exactly as planned, right? Forget the things that would prevent them from taking the next risk. Forget those things because in concept, you guys survived all of them, right? So you've gotten the lesson from it. The lesson was important. The event isn't. So how can we get to a place where we aren't scared to take risks because of what happened in the past? We can mitigate the stuff that happened, but we don't want that to be a parking brake that just keeps the car from moving forward. Right. And, and there's a series of exercises that we can go through, but I think the fundamental question is when you think about something that went a way that you didn't desire for it to go, and we can use my negotiation on Christmas Eve as an example, mm -hmm. did it happen to you or did it happen for you? Wow. If it happened for you, then how can you use the event to make you better, stronger, faster yeah. at whatever you're working on? If it happened, happened to you, and this is the difference between hero and victim, right? right? If it happened to you, you're a victim state, and you're figuring out ways to avoid that thing from happening to you. And so we want to forget the bad as quickly as possible, replace it with the good, and even with employees, right? So our employees are going to make mistakes. They're not going to get everything right. They may say they understand something and not understand it. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, can we forget? get that thing that they didn't do and remember the great stuff that they did. Because if we do and we reward them for that great stuff and concept, they're going to do more of that because we all want the acceptance. We all want the affirmations for the things that we do well. But as leaders, most times what we do is we just focus on the things that don't go right. We, we manage the chaos or the whirlwind or the tornado of our environment by just focusing on problems. And so we got our fire hose or we're running from one fire to the next instead right. of taking survey and inventory and looking at the things that are going really well and focusing right. on making more of that happen. Oh, that's so good. So kind of switching gears for a second, when we do as leaders get to a place where like, okay, we have the stream, we even to say it out loud kind of so sounds kind of crazy. Like how important is it to communicate that dream, you know, whether it, whether it's the place we want to go to or a business to start or something new to do, like how important is it to communicate even with ourselves out loud? How important is it to communicate to friends and family, you know, uh, in that whole process, you know, how should we go about that? Yeah. So you just gave me the softball. So let me see if I can get a basis <laughs> loaded grand slam here. Um, here's the thing, man, when you think about the five people you spend the most time with, mm -hmm. you know, the people will say, Hey, I'm, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. That's not true. What is true is you're the average of the expectations of the five people you spend the most time with. Wow. We, we move to expectations because that is what defines us. Here's the thing. If you don't tell if the five people that you spend the most time with have no idea what your dreams are, how could they ever help you? How could they support you? Wow. And if your dream is something that you can only do by yourself, then is it really a dream or is it just something on your to-do list? 
Boy, that's boy, that's good. That's good, right? Right. So for me, dreams dreams have to push you to a new level. I am, from my perspective, you have to become a fundamentally different person mm. in order to turn a dream into reality, and that's going to require the help of other people. Yeah, and so keeping your secret might protect other people from holding you accountable for making it true, but it's not going to do anything else to help you. And I'm not even sure that that lack of accountability is helpful. Right. Right. Wow. That's so profound. I mean, just thinking about like, if it really is a dream, you know, the to-do list or, you know, bringing those other people into it. So you've talked about, I mean, you, you've, done a lot in the real estate world when you moved into that was that one of those big dreams that were like okay oh oh, oh, yeah (laughs) oh yeah so i I still remember sitting on the stoop sophomore year with my buddy duran and he lived in the apartment beneath me three but we had three bedroom units had two roommates he had two roommates i was paying 395 my two roommates were doing the same thing the exact same thing was happening downstairs in this unit and we did the math across the complex. The guy was making seven hundred thousand dollars a year. We never saw him. We never talked to him. I'm the son of a soldier and a stay-at-home mom. Nobody with a multi-million-dollar real estate portfolio was coming over to the cookout, right? And so the question that Duran and I asked each other is, well, how did he do this? How? How? And we didn't have the answer. Right. And we never saw him, but we couldn't ask him. And so put the dream on the shelf. I'm going to go get a credit score. I'm going to go make some money. One day I'll be back to get this dream and we're going to do this. And so we went off and when I left corporate, I said, I'm going to figure out how to get this done. And I felt so silly. I'll be honest with you. I felt so silly when I went to the bank and they told me no. And then I went to the next one. And 10 banks later, I still got the answer no, but I did get the guidance to get a partner. Because the, the reason was no, not they didn't care about my MBA. They didn't care about my engineering license. They didn't care about my 800 credit score. They wanted me to have experience doing what I said I wanted to do. Mm. And if I didn't have that, then I needed to have somebody who had done it before to be my partner. Here's the thing. After all of that time in corporate America, I still hadn't met a single person who was doing the thing that I said I wanted to do when I was in college. Right. And I didn't do anything intentionally in order to get around people who were doing that thing. I felt silly, right? But this is when we talk about a dream and a to-do list. I needed new people and I had to become a fundamentally different person in order to be a person that those folks would want to partner with in order to go do this. You know, they don't do it just for fun. Like red weight on a business deal isn't something that happens. So I had to become somebody who would be attractive for them. And the way that I found that you do that in real estate is you get the knowledge so that you can find something that is a viable deal so you can present it to them because the deal is what they're interested in. And if you come with the deal, oh, well, maybe they're interested in you as well. Yeah. Wow. And so how is that for you? How is that dream gone then? Like catches up to, you know. Oh, yeah, man. So, I mean, we... We became one of the top rated, top requested speakers in a multifamily space. We helped other people get into the environment. We created a course. Um, we've been featured in magazines and wow. uh, at conferences speaking all over the country. Um, wow. But it was, that part was a little, a little bit lonely. And so, you know, the first iteration was I do it for myself. The next iteration was let me teach other people how to do it. And then what I found was, People were coming to me and wanting to borrow hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to go do this multifamily real estate thing. But the underpinning, right, the self-image, the relationship, those things weren't right. And so we were putting this debt on what I consider to be a shaky foundation. And so what I decided to do, instead of showing people the shiny object of being able to invest, I tell people from the beginning, I'm interested in making sure that you are ready for the burden that comes with this because the crown is heavy. And then when we get through, like we, I talked about the red pill a little bit, right? But self-image relationship work, that's all the stress in your life. Figure out how to turn the volume down on that. Then we focus on health. 
And then when we get to prosperity, you're ready to have this conversation about the risk associated with investing. But, you know, just piling on more debt and creating stress for somebody who's already stressed and needs to take the edge off. And I don't know anybody who takes the edge off by doing something healthy, right? We're just going to continue to hurt the person. And I, I want it not to hurt people. I, one of my affirmations is everybody that I encounter because of our interaction. Mm. And I felt like I was hurting people by giving them what they wanted, but knowing that it wasn't something that was going to set them up for the out that they desired for the long term. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's so much there. That's so rich. And uh, I know we could do like multiple podcasts just on uh, diving into diving into that. But, it, you know, as we like begin to wrap up, is there any lasting advice, you know, you'd give our leaders, our listeners, you know, if they're at this place, you know, where they're like, okay, I'm ready to jump into this journey. You know, they're doing the hard work, like you talked about with the self-image and, you know, those kind of things. And, you know, they're getting ready to communicate to the world. Like, you know, what would yeah. you, how would you prepare them? Yeah. I mean, so we talked about beliefs, thoughts, actions, and results. So foundationally, I need them to believe that their dreams should be real. And if you haven't heard that in a long time, that's okay. But you made it to this point of the interview. So now you are responsible for that. Because once you hear that, you can't unhear it. Then you can only have one or two actions, reactions to that. He's absolutely right. Let's go. <laughs> or... That probably works for some people, but not for me. Mm -hmm. The first person is a hero. The first, the second person is a victim. And you just got to decide which one you are. Foundationally, that statement is a truth, right? It's a law. Your dream should be real. The question is, will you do the work or will you would change the dream? The work has to be in alignment with the dream in order for it to become a reality. There is no way around that part. There's a price of admission to the fair. You can't cut the fence. You can't jump the fence. You, you got to go through the gate and you got to the price that they're asking at the ticket office. Yep. And if you do that, your dream will be real because if it's just the way that the universe works. Wow. Wow. I love that. I, I mean, I was taking notes as we were, as we were talking and I'm, it's going to be great to go back through this episode and, and uh, just dive into the, the notes a little bit more. Uh, hey, before we, uh, you know, we let you go fully, uh, I thought we'd just at the very end do a couple of rapid fire questions, let our listeners kind of keep getting to know you. But uh, I know you've written a couple books. Is there one that you're like just excited about writing, you know, someday, like something that's just been ruminating inside of you? Yeah, so we, we've created this space for people who were leaving corporate America or recently left corporate America where we, we take them, we call it extraction, we take them out of the country to somewhere in the Caribbean and, and we do a beginning or really accelerating the transformation so that they can go out and make that dream that they said they have and they set out to start creating a reality. We want to help them compress the timeline that it takes. And the fastest way that we're able to do that is to get them out of the day to day that they're normally in and allow them to focus on themselves. Because so many people who are apex performers put themselves last. And they don't focus on themselves and they believe that that is the way that they're going to get where they want to go. And that is partially true. But the other part that is probably even more important for where this group of people is, is that if you don't have the clarity, if you don't have the certainty, you will be off balance and scared and you probably won't take the action. Right. And so we need to build you up so that you get where you want to be. Wow. Is there a podcast that, you know, just, uh, you enjoy that it's kind of like a must listen to? Yeah, it might sound like a shameless plug, and it is, right? So we host the Dreamcatchers podcast, and we tell the stories of people who have exited the matrix, and that matrix is the existential crises that we talked about earlier. 
Yep. And the goal there is just to help folks navigate it on their own in case they're not ready to go with somebody else. We want them to have the tools, tips, and techniques necessary in order to make it to where they want to go. Wow. Wow. Okay. Last one, not not as heavy, but are, are you more of a Chick-fil-A person or a PDQ person? Oh, man. It's always Chick-fil-A, man. Bun, <laughs> pickle, pickle, chicken, bun. That's right. Uh, well, before we let you go, um, is there somewhere where our, you know, point is online to where our listeners can go and find out more about you and what, what you offer and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think the best place for the listeners to go would be itucktheredpill.co. And there you can find out more about us and what we've got going on. And if, you know, it really resonates with you, you can apply it and see if you're good for for working with us and our team. Wow. That's fantastic. Well, Jerome, thank you again for being a part of the Speed to Feel podcast. This has been such a rich, helpful conversation, especially, I mean, so many people get trapped up in their dreams and then the thought of even communicating them, you gave us just such solid practical advice. And uh, I just can't thank you enough for being a part today. So thank you. Jason, this is awesome. Thanks for having me. Man. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for joining us on the Speak With People podcast. Just a reminder, this podcast exists because we believe healthy communication is oxygen for relationships in your leadership. And so we hope that this podcast today has encouraged you, inspired you to communicate, to dream. Your dreams should be real. And so thank you again for joining us. Don't forget, we are coming up on the Speakers Conference. We're hosting March 21 to 23 in Clearwater Beach, Florida. Go to thespeakersconference.com, especially if you're a communicator who wants to learn how to be more effective, more compelling, um, uh, more captivating. We're going to dive into all of those kind of things. Thanks again for being a part of the Speak With People podcast community. Thanks again for every download and review that you leave. And we'll see you next week on the Speak With People podcast. Thanks so much. Bye.